Hello and welcome back to Where Are All My Friends, recording this immediately after recording the episode because I am so fired up. I dare say this is one of the best episodes that I have recorded. It is with Jake Posner, who is a music manager and the founder of Culture Theory, which is a full service artist management company with producers as well. The reason I am so fired up on this episode though is because two things. One, I love in his story that there was never this lucky break moment. He had seven plus years of grinding and just doing things that he was interested, curious, and passionate about. And the way that that story connects and like really ultimately gets him to the point of having success is wild. He now manages the band Arizona. He has since day one, and that was a huge, huge moment and piece of his story, but how he gets there is wild. The second reason that I love this conversation so much is we talked about a topic that I think needs to be talked about quite a lot more and something that he wrote an entire article about and has started an entire petition around and that is the subject of the great follower disconnect and the mental health and stability of artists in the music industry and the constant pressure and need to always be putting more and more media out. He's so well-spoken and shared this idea so, so well. And this isn't pointing fingers or blaming anyone. It's purely a topic and an idea and a discussion that he has started that I think is so important. And for all of those reasons, this was such a great episode. I really hope you enjoy it. Let's get into it. Where are all my friends? Jake Posner. Huge hello, shout out hello. to Nick Maley again for the connection. <laughs> Dude, I'm excited, man. I uh, Right before we started recording this, I, I was just telling you briefly, like I, I organically saw everything that you are up to online because of a very specific post that I think is a very necessary thing to start talking about. But then even past that, it just looks like you're doing so many rad things in music. And it's one of those people where I see your online profile and I see the connections and I'm like, we're destined to be friends. So yeah. thank you for taking the time. I'm, I'm genuinely hyped. Yeah, man. It's great to meet you. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, dude, for sure. And like to, to, I guess to start the episode for a listener who doesn't know who you are, just quickly yeah. a brief explanation of who you are and everything that you do. Sure. Um, I mean, most fundamentally, I'm just a kid who loved music and was lucky to fall into it. But, you know, professionally now, I am an artist manager. I'm a songwriter and a producer manager and an A&R. And um, I found a band called Arizona about six and a half years ago. And have, that's been really the, the core of my business for such a long time and it continues to be. And then in the last two years or so, I got involved with writers and producers and I built out a writer producer division of, of, of what I do. And it's just been the greatest joy of my life, the greatest blessing. And I'm just honestly so happy to do it. Happy to be here every day. That's so cool because I think that music and specifically that industry, the highs are very high, but the lows are some bullshit. And I think you genuinely yeah. have to love what you do to yeah. keep going at it. So I feel that just in you explaining it, that you, you really do care about what you do. Oh, hundred percent, man. I mean, it's, it's the core philosophy of what drives me every day. And, and anybody that I meet will probably regurgitate the story that I tell them of like, when I was 16, my dad sat me down and asked me what I wanted to do after college. And I was like, well, dad, I'm 16. I love music. I love video games. What do you want from me? And he was like, well, when I graduated college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I joined a family business and 30 years went by, I blinked and I'm still here, you know? And he's like, uh, we were very comfortable and fortunate growing up, but he's like, I hate what I do. You know, my career brings me no joy. I'm stressed out all the time and we spend way too much of our lives working. You know, and he was like, so I'm just telling you this now to plant the seed and I'll tell your brothers when the time comes. But when you graduate college, the family business doors are closed to you. It's not an option. You know, he's like, I want you to think about what you love, because if you love something, you'll get good at it. You get good at it. And money will come. And that was the ideal I was so lucky to be raised on. And that's the primary driver of why everything I do is so passion oriented. It's so passion driven. I have to love it, you know, because the highs and lows, especially in music are so real. But if you can be really, really in love with what you're doing on a daily basis, it makes it a lot easier, <laughs> you know, to, to, to glide through it. Holy, holy fucking shit. Like I, I normally that moment where I do the thing where I'm like, comes at about like the 50 minute mark, right? Like, yeah. it's like, oh, there's the promo clip. Like, oh, but like that was, I mean, that's insane to me. And I think about this so often, actually like quite a lot more recently, but the importance or the the factor of encouraging family and, and your upbringing. And 
holy shit, shout out to your dad for being that Seriously. aware and for instilling that in you and, and forcing you to look to that direction. Like, oh my God. Yeah, man. I'm so grateful for it. I'm grateful to have parents that have supported me every step of the journey, you know, and it's it's a very, very lucky blessing that I know not a lot of people, not everybody is fortunate enough to have. But, yeah. you know, I think that's why I always try to be a beacon and a source of positivity for others of just saying like, look, if you're happy that you're doing this, if you're just happy to be here, like you're in the right place. I promise you. I love podcasts, though, because I think we're well aware, like not everybody is going to have those parents that sit them down at that moment and all of that. Yeah. But now more so than ever, I love the fact that if you have an inkling of a passion or something, yeah. you can find so many resources online and through conversations of people that do feel the same way as you. So mm -hmm. even if you are a little more alone in whatever your environment is, you can hear conversations from people that you feel you directly relate to and that can push yeah. you. So that's something like I really, again, resonate with that. But I, yeah, I mean, honestly, it's like, it's even a testament to what you're doing, Andrew. I mean, it's podcasts like these that, especially as I was first trying to figure out my place in this business, in this world that helped inspire me by hearing the stories of others, you know, it was I'd like the, the main one that really drove me on the way was like how I built this NPR, Yes, you know, yeah. here, yeah, you hear the real human stories behind it that not only takes these these figureheads and these executives that you look up to and just ponder like, how could I ever, how is that even fucking possible? You yeah. know, and then you hear their actual perspectives and you're like, wait, they're just figuring it out just like I am. You know, yeah. they've just been figuring it out a lot longer than I have. And okay, cool. Yeah, cool. Let's figure it out. Let's keep figuring Dude, it out. <laughs> literally that and it's so funny you reference that because i literally like my elevator pitch or the quickest explanation of what i do is i i it's basically think how i built this for creative careers so That's i love incredible. that you yeah That's so okay awesome. my my first real question for you then is like okay yeah. awesome you have this amazing father and you have this encouragement at such an early age but like i know very well the first couple years or the bit of time in like being like, all right, it's music. It's not yeah. easy. And it's a real struggle. So like, yeah. what did that look like for you in that 16 to 18 and figuring it out? Like, did you instantly yeah. know it would be management? Did you play music? Like, how did you totally. start to put it together? Totally, totally. And first, I will also shout out my mother because she has been a huge reason of, of this too. And it was soon after the conversation with my dad, I was 16. And for a time reference, this is 2006. And the reason that that, is, that reference is important was it was around that time that my world of music and video games and just trying to figure out where I belonged had kind of collided. And I got thrown into, I used to play a lot of Xbox Live back in the day. I'm still a, still a big gamer today, but oh. I got thrown into a random game of Xbox Live playing a game called Gears of War with uh, none other than Soldier Boy Tellum and all of his friends. <laughs> and this is in the prime of the Frank that era, mind you. And he was playing a lot of Xbox. And I was just the random kid that got thrown into the, you know, into the mix of him um, and his friends playing a game. And the other crazy part was the other team was DJ Unk and all of DJ Unk's friends. And again, random kid from Long Island who knows none of these people, but here I am. And I'm also like a hip hop, a big hip hop fan. I was definitely paying attention to Soldier Boy. So that was a bizarre, crazy thing. But I, and I'm a huge believer in everything happening for a reason. So I, I just yes. was like, cool, <laughs> let's go with it. Let's see what happens. And we ended up playing together for a number of weeks. And, you know, we never got that close. Soldier Boy would never recognize me in a room, would never hear, would never recognize my name likely. But, you know, what I did get was my first peek behind the curtain of what success in the music industry looked like. And, you know, how I got that was I was just paying a little extra attention to Soldier Boy after being now in his orbit of video gaming. You know, yeah. he had some early days, I don't even remember what platforms it was, but live stream. And I was just watching, you know, here was this kid who had just moved out to LA, bought this big, beautiful house, was really living life. You know, yeah. and he was, he, had to he was doing them too. Totally, you know, but yeah. he was living the dream that every artist aspires to live. And just because I was kind of peeking in to see what was going on, I was kind of paying a little extra attention to like, what were the things that he was doing that kind of contributed to that success? And the biggest thing that stuck out to me was, you know, I was watching, you know, he was, he kind of was kind of running in the studio and doing whatever, but his studio was his living room. And I was watching that he was producing on his laptop that had Fruity Loops, but he didn't have any crazy bells and whistles that none of us could ever obtain. You know, especially a 16 year old kid in Long Island with a laptop or a computer. I was like, cool. It's Fruity Loops. Fru it's that thing's called Fruity Loops. I was like, cool. I'm going to download that. I'm going to start making beats. You know, I loved hip hop. And so I actually started as a producer. Before that, I had played instruments. I grew up, like, my dad taught me drums very early. He's always been a drummer and he's always loved drums. And so, like, rhythm and percussion have been important to me. And then 
growing up, you know, elementary, middle, high school, they always had my, my, my district had a, a really cool requirement to where we basically had to play instruments until the eighth grade. So I played drums, I played trumpet, I played cello, I went back to drums. I was never, mind you, I'm not that proficient of a musician by any stretch, <laughs> but, but it was really cool. And so, you know, I had always been a little bit inclined to do more creative things and to do more music, you know, kind of music oriented things. And so I started producing music. I went to school in Indiana. Um, and I was the kid on my freshman floor trying to get his Rick Rubin on. I was just trying to produce kids out and my roommate ended up being a rapper. And, you know, my still now best friend on my freshman floor was a, a kid from Jersey who wanted to be rapping. And we just started making music and it was the most incredible process just to really know what it's like to be so deep in the creative process to kind of help people figure out how to express themselves in whatever format it might be. But, um, yeah, that was kind of how I, how I started. In that story, like, like yeah. I'm, in real time, I'm like, okay, go on, go on. And I was so <laughs> ready for you to be like, so we became best friends. Soldier Boy flew me out. I started producing for him. And it wasn't that. I love that no. you were just like, this is cool. And it made you pay that little bit more attention because that's so much more real, right? Like, yeah. that's one funny, like, little, like, moment. But then the real outcome where it's like, okay, then from there, it sparked that thing. So that's incredible. So then, okay, you start as a producer, you're working with your friends. Did you ever have a moment in that where it was like, oh shit, I'm, this is it. Like, I'm going to have a song or like a song starts hitting or w did you run into like a thing of like, maybe this isn't it. Did, maybe I should manage or like, what did that look like? Yes. So, so <laughs> there were definitely, I'm sure as all of us have moments in the creative process to where I think we were like, oh my God, this is incredible. So many people are going to really connect with this. And we started putting it out on YouTube and nothing happened. Um, really? And <laughs> I mean, in hindsight too, the stuff we were making was definitely not great. But, you know, I think it was after about a year I had realized that I love, I mean, being in the studio still today is my favorite place to be. It's the most magical yeah. place to be. But I realized yeah. that my seat in the studio was not in the producer chair. You know, mm. I knew what I wanted things to sound like. I was always a kid that was discovering music. I was always a kid that was sharing music and was kind of like a curator of sorts. I just realized that I was not as passionate about spending five hours at, you know, at the, 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 the producer chair just to try to figure out, oh, how do I get the drums to sound right? Or I really want this sound. Like I knew what I wanted things to sound like. I had no idea how to get them there. I knew nothing about the engineering of logic at the time. And, you know, so I decided to take a step back from that seat and, you know, I was in business school, I was studying marketing, I was like, I need to probably think about what other possible disciplines in music, which I had already at that point, like fully committed to, yeah, would make sense. And, you know, I spent the rest of my years of college doing anything from blogging for a bunch of the different college blogs, you know, this is like 2009 to 2013, when the college <laughs> blogs were very much a thing. Fucking yeah. excellent era for music <laughs> discovery and blogs and hype machine and like yeah. all that. It was yeah. really a special time. And, and so I did that. And I just wanted to be a sponge. So, you know, ever, when I got back to New York, I had no connections in the music industry, but my, my wonderful classic Long Island Jewish mother was just asking, saying, oh, my son's looking to work in music. Does anybody work in yes. music? Does anybody know anybody? And fortunately, that brought me to one of my very first mentors who had connected me with a small record label in Union Square, not, you know, like a, a small record label called Megaforce Records that was known for Anthrax and Slightly Stupid and Third Eye Blind and the Black Crows. And, um, okay. you know, I yeah, was just lucky. Yeah. I was just lucky to be in that building and working with everybody there. And I was, you know, I was just more or less like an intern, whatever they needed me to do if it was going through royalty statements. It was giving a little bit of consulting input on a slightly stupid merch campaign, whatever it could, was, I just wanted to learn. And going back to school, I had asked them if there was a way for me to kind of stay involved in music and keep learning. And, um, they worked really closely with Sony red at the time. And so I became a campus rep for Sony and you know, what that meant was I was putting up flyers and posters around campus and I was trying to set up listening parties and just spread the word for whoever Sony Red's priorities were at the time. And that gave me an appreciation for what it's like to really be a foot soldier on the ground to try to promote stuff. And oh yeah. And through that too, <clears throat> I had fallen into 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 kind of the mix with a brand that was coming out of my school at the time. It was called Dope, D O P E, and then also known as Dope Couture. And they had a little run after after I'd left, but I, I was such a cool thing to watch a brand go from flagship to a real staple, especially out in LA. And was that the was brand with the hats, the flat yep. brim hat? Oh yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. That was dope. And you know, when I graduated, I wasn't going to LA. You know, I that was never my plan. I'm I'm a ride or die New Yorker. That is that is my favorite place to be. I mean, I'm I'm in LA right now for for a writing trip, but New York is my home. And yeah. you know, and so I came back to New York and my hope was to get a real job in music and, you know, hopefully in the marketing world. And, you know, the reality of New York City is the same as is in LA is it's 40,000 kids competing for 12 jobs. It's not an easy game. 
you know, and I was not a lucky one of the 12. And so I ended up thinking about, all right, well, if it's not going to be music, you know, what else am I passionate about? I do need a job. <laughs> and, yeah, and so, yeah. and so, you know, leaving school with a marketing degree, I, I was like, and, and also with my experience with dope specifically, I was like, it was really cool to work with a brand, especially a brand that I was passionate about. So maybe the world for me right now is advertising. And if it, and if it works out, awesome. If it doesn't work out, hopefully I can take all the lessons I've learned about how the big brands do it and I can apply it to music one day. And yeah. so I proceeded to go into advertising for the better part of two and a half, three years, um, anywhere from doing social media for a publication called Ad Age to um, being a media planner for Time Inc. and like, you know, Sports Illustrated, People Magazine. I put all the, like, the banner ads that you see across the internet on different websites to no um, being an account executive or like a creative consultant in a way for American Express. And, you know, it was all such an incredible experience just learning from these incredible big brands and this big agency and how the digital media world works. And, um, but at the end of it, I just realized that I wasn't, it wasn't kind of going back to what my dad had told me. Like, I didn't feel like I was as passionate as I could be about it every day. Yeah. And it was like um, adjacent to passionate. Like you, you had elements yeah. of it that you liked, but it wasn't there. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I felt some form of an existential crisis <laughs> back then. This is 2015 <laughs> for time reference now. And, um, yeah, so you're in I your just, like early mid twenties. Yeah. I was 23. And yeah. I, you know, I just needed some time to decompress and stop thinking about everything. And, and for me, that has always been Reddit. And so I just went on Reddit late one night and I'm just browsing aimlessly with no intention of anything whatsoever. And I'm just scrolling down the video subreddit and a few hours in and I stumble upon this video and it's like, hey guys, it's my first time singing on camera. We shot, edited, directed this ourselves, covered a Taylor Swift song. I hope you like it. And I was like, yeah, cool. I have nothing better to do. Sure. <laughs> and I clicked it. And it turned out to be the first video that kids that called themselves Arizona had ever put on the internet. And I watched it. I was blown away, you know, and I, the thing was, is like, you know, and I always preface this too, is artist management was never the discipline that I saw myself doing ever, ever. You know, yeah. I was at, I was at this point coming out of the world of marketing and I was like, I'm a marketing guy. That's where yeah. I want to be. I want to be a, a, a marketing director or a product manager as they're called yeah. the labels now. And, and especially in that moment, I would have to assume like, it's not like you were like sitting down being like, here's my strategic pivot to management. You were literally like, I need a fucking <laughs> second to chill. Yeah, very much so. And, you know, but the thing was, what was so compelling about it was a, this is, they said it's their first video. And I was like, mm -hmm. they, there was a production value and it's still on YouTube. They covered bad blood and there was a production value to this video, but there was a sound, something I'd never heard before. And this is all of a sudden where blogger Jake was like, what is this? Like, this is sick. And, and, you know, and so I went to the YouTube channel to try to find more music, but it ended up not even being their YouTube channel. It was a friend of theirs. So there was no other links to music. And I just responded on the Reddit thread, like still blogger Jake, mind you, no artist management thought. And I was like, yo, this is great. You have any more music? And they're like, oh yeah, we have a SoundCloud. And I went to SoundCloud and I, they had five songs up there. It was like two originals and three covers. And I listened to everything and I was, I was blown away. I was just like, holy fucking shit. This is my new favorite band. These guys are incredible. I've never heard something like this. And, yeah. you know, the, the kind of real like stomach dropping, oh shit, you know, heart racing moment was I had realized that this band had less than a thousand streams on each of these songs. They had no social media. They had 70 followers. You know, and the biggest kicker was that this band that's called Arizona is not from Arizona. They're from New Jersey. And I was living in New York City. And I was like, oh, shit. You know, I'm like, this is way too close to home, literally. <laughs> and, you know, and I, I was just so compelled. And I was like, is this like what I was meant to find? Am I supposed to manage this? Like, because if I, this is just way too compelling. Yeah. To, to to not get involved and i know and that so, feeling right like you see yeah. it and you're like you're you're like confused you're like why has no one else seen this you're like worried yeah. you're like am i crazy is there something else at play here what's going right. on yeah right and and so like you know they didn't even have an email to reach them so i just decided to send them a you know a, a dm on soundcloud and i was like hey i'm jake you know this is my story up until now and your music is just so incredible and i feel like it is so much bigger than it currently is and i just love to help get it there however i possibly can and they ended up reaching out a few days later and it was uh dave the band's keyboardist and you know he was like hey like really cool that you're reaching out you know like we haven't you know we're not talking to anybody on the management front but i actually come from the creative side of advertising and i see that you come from more of the operational side he's like i feel like we could probably have some cool synergies and i was like awesome cool yeah whatever whatever it takes i'm i'm there and we ended up meeting up a few weeks later and 
you know, it turned out that that these kids were writers and producers in music for the better part of about a decade, but they were trying to develop other artists. And, you know, they never had that moment to really kind of cross things over and make it a bona fide business. And so they, you know, they were kind of on the last stitch effort of what plan A was to do music full time. And they had decided instead of trying to make music for other people, let's just make some stuff that we love. You know, let's just make music that we're really passionate about. And if something happens, great. If it doesn't, you know what, you know, plan B was Zach, our lead singer was going to be a history teacher. And Dave, you know, our keys player was already doing really well at Al Jazeera doing a lot of their creative and, um, and Nate, our guitarist was going to go into it and that would have been it. And here I was some starry eyed 23 year old kids sitting across the table from them on the high line in Chelsea, just being like, you guys belong at stadiums and arenas. And like, this is just so big. And I remember them laughing because they were like, that's just crazy. That's just absolutely crazy. But they saw how passionate I was, you know, and, and they absolutely in their hearts felt like that this is something that could happen too. And so we decided to take a chance on each other. And, you know, from there, I just kind of hit the ground running while they were making music that continued to blow my mind every single day. You know, I'm just yeah. sitting there in the studio after I would, you know, after my agency job at night, I would just get on the train, go to Jersey, sit in the studio with them while they're making music. And I was just blasting out emails to as many possible people as I could. And this was still the tail end of the blog era. So there were a lot of tastemakers and a lot of voices that could champion music. And my thought was, let's find the champions. There's no way I'm the only person that loves this music as much as I do. There's no way. Right. And, you know, and slowly but surely things started to connect and um, we ended up starting to get looks on smaller blogs and then all of a sudden a bigger blog. And then all of a sudden Mr. Suicide Sheep, which was a huge, huge outlet at the time that I loved. And it still kind of has a thing. Totally. I mean, they were one of the first like incredible curators that I had just really, I was just so passionate to follow. And, and, you know, before we knew it, we're having real label conversations. We're talking to real executives, people that I really didn't know who they were because I wasn't in the mix. I wasn't in the music industry. I have and, to pause here. Yeah, because please. I've I've had this thought as you're explaining this story of I think it's so fucking cool that you were this interested and passionate about music, but every step of your story up until this moment, and even this moment yeah. counts, but I'll explain, you didn't have that lucky break. Like mm. everything you're saying, I'm like, oh, he met Soldier Boy, the, the producer. No. <laughs> oh, he became a producer and then he got that one song. No. Right. Oh, uh, he, the brand dope. And then uh, he met somebody in LA. No. Yeah. Oh, the advertising thing. No. Yeah. And if I'm, if I'm doing the math right, that's about seven years of doing yeah. something that you're passionate about with relatively no success. 100%, 100%. That's fucking insane. And it's so easy right now. And I say this so often. It's so easy right now to think yeah. that everything is like instant success and totally. to like not have something click in six months and give up. Yeah. And it's like, look at you now. And we're getting into it, like starting to work. Yeah. Seven years. And then yeah. the, it wasn't even the lucky Reddit moment. In all reality, that was a yeah. ton of back and forth and a ton of like building. It wasn't them just saying yes in the first DM. And yeah. I just I think that that's fucking crazy. And I love that you stayed that persistent. And yeah. then as you're you're already kind of naturally getting to it. But I would have to imagine because I had a similar age and time where I was kind of going from one thing to another and being like, I'm a manager now. Right. And <laughs> like, there's no real rules to that. There's no yeah. real formal education to that. But here right. you are and you believe in this thing and you convince them and thank fucking God you did. But you have this utmost certainty that it's going to work. Yeah. Did you... How did you start to acquire those skills? You're, you're, you're sending it out to blogs. Now majors are hitting you up. Did you have a moment of like, oh, fuck, imposter syndrome. I'm not qualified to talk to majors. Or were oh, yeah. you good enough at researching? And did you have enough connections where you could be like, hey, mentor friend, uh, X major label reached out. What do I do now? And how did that look? <laughs> so the cool thing about that that was, it wasn't that I had all that I had resources that I was really bouncing these, these meetings or conversations off of. I mean, it was really my parents at the time, but also, Mm -hmm. I mean, a huge testament to Zach David and native Arizona was like, because they, these guys have been in the music industry, even in the outer rim of it as writers and producers, a lot of these names are familiar to them. You know, they had ideas of who, you know, when the name Mike Karen came up, they're like, that guy can put you on the radio. They're like that, that dude can put you on the radio. Like we were, you know, and so I, and, and, and also, you know, like the band's big brother and one of our closest collaborators and, and a producer that I actually even manage today, his name is PJ Bianco, you know, 
PJ had been in it for, he was the guy who kind of taught the band everything way back when. They, the band were his interns in the studio. They're all from Jersey. And PJ came up doing the first ever Jonas Brothers album. And then, you know, his career kind of really continued on from there. But he had been more experienced too, in terms of just like helping guide us of figuring out like, yeah, these are people we should talk to. And, you know, really beyond that. And, and also, I think it's just a reason that I, I always tell people is like, it doesn't matter what you know, what you don't know. Trust the head on your shoulders because. I came into every meeting the same way that I would with anybody in any industry it was like, cool. Like just, I would love to hear about what you're thinking about. I I'm always down to listen. I'm always down for a conversation. And so after a bunch of conversations, we ended up meeting Ben Madahi, who at the time he's now at Columbia, but at the time he was working directly under Mike at APG and um, you know, and they just started talking and we just realized that we were talking to people that were not only incredibly intelligent and very gifted at what they did, but, they have a real track record for success. And we just realized, okay, you know what? Like, this feels right. We can either keep trying to do it on our own independently, but, you know, all of us were kind of trying to put whatever money we had into it. And we had no idea what the lifespan would be if we did it that way. Or why don't we partner up with people that we know, that we know without a doubt know what they're doing, you know, yeah. and can help us. And, you know, and so the crazy part was from finding them, you know, that was, this was June 29th, 2015. You know, we had ended up signing our, our first deal to Mike Karen and APG in Atlantic December 13th of 2015. It was five months, you know, and it was a, a whirlwind, man, because the, the, and the biggest thing, too, and I tell a lot of people this also is like, I was green as a cucumber. I knew nothing, absolutely yeah. nothing about what it was to really be a manager and to really work with a major label. And so I was just trying to, I just wanted to trust the head on my shoulders and everybody around me of just. Let's make the best decisions we can. Let's make sure we're listening to everybody, yeah. you know, yeah. and we'll take it a day at a time. But that was all of a sudden. And, and, but the imposter syndrome was so real because here I am sitting across the table from Julie Greenwald and Craig Coleman and Mike Karen. And I'm just like, I, I, you know, I'm like, I'm here. I'm here. Right. We have a meeting on the books. It's on my calendar, but like, I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's not like, I'm sure when you're sitting down in those meetings, like obviously the things spoken about are things you're familiar with, right? Absolutely. Like you're talking about advertising, you're talking about rolling out songs that you believe in, yeah. you understand producing. It's not that you can't speak to it. It's yeah. more just like, oh shit, I'm here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for me, that was actually, I mean, it was incredibly motivating, incredibly inspiring because I, I basically, I, I opened up and the banded to them of basically saying like, look guys, like I, trust the head on my shoulders to make good responsible decisions. But also I know that I'm sitting across the table from people who have been doing this at the highest level for decades. And I would mm. be an idiot to not listen to you. I mean, so absolutely- you had a very uh, <laughs> strong self-awareness and humility to, to understand the, like, not like come oh, yeah. and fake it and be like, oh, I'm the world's biggest major label manager. Like you were oh, like, God. teach me, learn. I'm yeah. open. Yeah. No, I mean, we had not, we didn't, we hadn't actually accomplished anything outside of, you know, all of a sudden having this streaming wave, which we didn't even fully comprehend of what that even meant, you mm. know, and all of a sudden here we are with, with APG and Atlantic records. And it's like, their track records insane. And I was like, yeah, cool. Like I'm, we're here to listen, you know, like I'll make the best decisions that I can. And I trust the head on my shoulders, but like you guys have been doing this for decades. Like, please, whenever you have thoughts, whenever you have opinions, like know that I'm here to listen. And yeah. it was incredible because that ended up in kind of leading Atlantic and APG to really kind of, embrace us with open arms of saying like look like come in here we ended up working you know we were we were in the building of atlantic records for the first probably three years of arizona at least three days a week um you know the boys and i were living in new jersey we lived in a house together as soon as we kind of signed and we kind of went full incubator mode when we made our first album i slept above the studio and i lived with you know i lived with zach and nate and dave lived right down the block and you know and so we would just get in the car every morning drive over to atlantic and just hang with everybody, pop into everyone's offices. Harlan Fry, who was the head of touring at the time, gave us so much valuable lessons on, you know, who, how to pick our agent and making good touring decisions and all these things. And, you know, we kind of played that that game of just really just kind of learning from everybody. Paul Sinclair, who was the head of digital, now the GM, you know, all these people were just so, so wonderful and just really teaching us and coming up with our team, learning with our team. I mean, they're family to me today. And, um, I, I I wouldn't be anywhere without those lessons. And so it's like, there's always experiences to learn and that's that process never, ever stops. And I think it was just a matter of like, you know, take the wave that you're riding on, but don't let that blind you. You know, there's so many people to learn from every single day and the landscape is changing every single day. So keep learning, keep yeah. your ears open, you yeah. know? 
Did you, I love that. Did you have a moment where it started to shift or it clicked where you're like, okay, cool. I got this. Like I'm a manager now. Or like you could like pay the bills <laughs> enough to be like, all right, yeah, like we're here. <laughs> the bills game has, has, was hard for a long time. Um, yeah. for all of us. And that's, look, that's even touching upon what we started about is like the look, stability in the music industry is a very hard thing to come by for anybody. You know, I think the imposter syndrome was real for a long time until probably like we started to do bigger shows. We started to do big festival plays and all of a sudden we're seeing all of these people show up to watch Arizona. And this is something that was basically just starting in David's basement in New Jersey. And it was just us, you know, just, just peddling the music to blogs and anybody that would champion it to seeing that okay, we've got real fans. Like, this is crazy. Like, we're selling out, you know, our first headline tour sold out in a matter of days. And we're like, okay, <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> you know? And I think it was kind of, I mean, I can't pinpoint the exact moment to where I, I started to feel, you know, more confident in myself as a manager, but it was just a matter of like, I, I would, what I would say is that kind of really, really helped was, the same thing of I opened myself up just to, to learn from everybody around me. And I've been so lucky to learn from a lot of executives that have been doing it at such a high level. You know, Becca Tishker, who manages Julia Michaels, you know, Neil Jacobson, Mike Karen, Julie Harlan. I mean, there are so many, I mean, the list really does go on and on. And I think one of the most incredible parts about it, and, and including these podcasts, by the way, you know, and NPR, like, you know, I had just started to see that these people that I had fashioned in my head is like, these untouchable, successful, successful people, I had started to realize that they were human like me. They were figuring it out every day like me, you know? And I think that to me is just like one of the greatest realizations because it made me realize that anything really is possible. It's just a matter of keep working at it, keep perfecting your craft, keep sharpening the sword, you know? And I think as I realized that kind of the, that feeling and weight of, do I belong here? Why am I here? Kind of dissipated because it was like, everyone is figuring it out every day. No one has this grand plan of 12 years to come. I have every step plotted because that, that road changes every five minutes. So yeah. I think it's just like, trust yourself, make good decisions, be good to people, be good to your relationships. And that was where it started for me. That's so cool. That's so, so cool. Because I, I know that feeling all too well, but I think yeah. that you expressed that so well and relatably. And what I'm so oh, in on in your story is just like, this is everything I want to do in the podcast, right? I want to encourage people to continue to press forward and to keep going. And yeah. what I genuinely love about your story is like, it. there is no moment in this where I could say, oh, you just got lucky. Like, <laughs> no, it was just day after day after day, yeah. perfecting it that little bit, that little, little bit, being humble enough to learn and trusting yeah. yourself, but also kind of just being down to dance with that uncertainty and just doing your best and like all of it coming together over a ton of time yeah, to slowly but surely get you to a spot where you really fucking do this. Yeah, man. And, and you know, look, I think the luckiest moment was finding the band you know, on Reddit yeah, and just stumbling upon this video at the right time in the right place. And yeah, but how many people would have done that? How many people, if, if you had been in a yeah. different mindset or in anything would have stumbled upon it and been like, oh, cool. Like you could have totally. been like sick video. You could have kept scrolling. You could have like not believed it. Be like, oh yeah, first video. Sure. Like right. whatever, right. like anything. So like even that moment could have been missed if you didn't have that excitement and that yeah. that moment to just really stop and look at that and that's another yeah. cool lesson that i take from your story to like maybe look at my life a little bit more detailed or to like look at these moments of these little cool things and be like wait a minute maybe i should turn that stone over a little bit more right how yeah. many how many of these opportunities do we all have in life that we maybe scroll by a little too fast it's it, it follow your gut, follow feeling. That's the, those are the two, those are the two guiding lights for me. And, you know, and you're right. And I think, but also even to the concept of like luck and I, I've really started to kind of even dissect it a little bit more in the last two years. And it's a very, very common phrase, but I never really thought about it was like, luck is just preparation meets opportunity, right? That's what luck is. It's not an intangible. It is, it, it's just when something comes that you feel like you're meant to do, or you want to pursue, learn about it, prepare for it, try to figure it out, understand it. And I think when I found, you know, when I found the boys on Reddit, it was a matter of like, I was just a passionate person, always trying to discover music. I kept following the rabbit hole and I was still trying to find my place in the world. So little did I realize I was prepared in some way, there was the opportunity yep. and I took it. 
And yeah, man, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's incredible. And I'm just, we're just so grateful to be here. I too think about that often. I think you expressed that in a really good way, but I was thinking about this with a different application where I was, I was trying yeah. to explain to somebody that you never know in the moments that you are preparing, that you are preparing, right? Yeah. Like, uh, I'll use myself as an example, right? Like if I were to be a host or if somebody wanted me to like moderate something or to like host a podcast or something, it's not like two and a half, three years ago, me when I started the podcast was preparing for that one day that somebody would ask me to do this. Right. You no, know, like I just started a podcast because I like it. Right. But now those years of stacking would then make me more qualified to do something like that. Was that right. the plan all along? No. But is that by effect and action something that would then make more and more sense every day and every episode sure so like i get kind of caught in that as well as like the more you just do the shit you love one day when somebody needs a person for that thing and you're just the genuine one that does it and loves it a bunch you're probably gonna be top of mind mm. and i like that idea is such a funny one and i think it yeah. also speaks to do the shit you love because every day like you're kind of accidentally becoming more and more qualified as a as the one in that field dude without a doubt and i resonate with that a lot because that's also a, that's kind of very similar to how my story continued to develop after you know in the last bunch of years i mean arizona has been the reason i've become an artist manager and an artist manager and got into that business but in recent years and over quarantine i had fallen into the world of writer and producer management be oh, because yeah. of my, my big brother and mentor, Neil Jacobson. And he had just asked me, you know, quarantine had hit. And, and, you know, as far as Arizona goes, it, it typically takes us about two to three years to make a record. And, you know, so all of a sudden we found ourselves in quarantine and the timing ended up working in a, in a way to where the boys are just working on music, but I had a lot of free time and I'm just sitting at home trying to figure out what can I do, you know, in this, and we in a, in a time period where no one knows how long we're going to be in quarantine but i just didn't want to stop growing i didn't want to stop learning and you know i was lucky to get a call from neil and just, you know who we'd, we'd known each other for years and, and really really respected and, and respected and admired each other and he just called me and he's like hey i'm starting a writer producer management company you know i know we've been trying to find ways to work together for a long time i think this is it can you help me build it and i i, I was like oh, and he's like you know i'm not asking you to move to new to move to LA. He knows I'm a very proud and stubborn New Yorker. He's like, I'm not even asking for a piece of your artist business. I just, I believe that you can help me build this. And he's like, you know, I'll put you on salary. I'll give you commissions. You'll be the head of the New York office, whatever you need, let's do it. And I mean, <laughs> that was the, the easiest yes I've ever had to give in my entire <laughs> career. And I was like, of course, because he's like, I'll teach you the writer producer stuff. It's, mm -hmm. it's not as complicated as it might seem. And mm. I did that, you know, we worked together at, at Hallwood. It was Hallwood Media is the company that Neil, you know, Neil still runs today. And we did that for about a year. And after about a year, we parted ways only because he had needed to consolidate to LA, wanted me to move. And I was like, you know, New York is home for me. But all yeah. of a sudden I found myself with a roster of songwriters and producers that I was now managing. And I was like, well, I'm still managing them. And I, I was like, well, I'll fold them into, into the business that I started, you know, off the heels of Arizona called the culture theory. And I was like, Whoa, 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 like I have an artist management business, but now I have writers and producers. And so technically that makes it, I have a full scale music management company. What? You know what? Like, this is a thing like, okay, yeah. okay. I'm here for it. Let's figure yeah. it out. And right. you know, the beauty of that is like, I think when you hit these moments of like, okay, like now I have to figure this out. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly motivating and inspiring of saying, all right, so like, what are the steps to build an infrastructure to support this business? You know? Mm -hmm. And, and it was, you know, and, and that's just been a matter of building an incredible team around myself to support that. And, you know, and it's just been so cool because the evolutions of any business are so natural. You know, I think it takes, you know, a passion to want to learn and want to grow. But, you know, as long as you keep moving forward and pushing, you know, like I always kind of go back to the, 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 the fundamental quote of, of in physics of inertia is an object in motion stays in motion, right? An object at rest stays at rest. And I think all of us every day, we're in motion whether we realize it or not. Yes. And all of a sudden, yes. these big milestones start happening. And we're like, how is that happening? It's like, well, you've been working towards it. You just didn't realize you've been working towards it. Yes. You know? And it's a really special thing to see. And, and it's, 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 it's continually empowering, continually motivating and inspiring, you know? Well, right. And, and that, like you just said that so, so well again, but it's like the all these things that you learned even in your marketing days like every step of the way 
Yeah. You didn't know that you would have a full scale music company here at this moment. Right. Like you, when your dad asked you at 16, like there's no <laughs> way you would have been like, all right, pops, here's what it's going to look like. Not That's even not close. that. Not but even close. every step of the way, because you were doing what you naturally loved and connecting these pieces and by necessity and default learning yeah. these steps. Now, here we are. I'm talking I'm like, well, yeah, of course you could do that. That makes perfect <laughs> sense. But again, it's like, I, I just love in your story that there isn't any real like lucky break moment like it's yeah. just being passionate and showing up every fucking day huh every day every day and and, and that's the beautiful part about it is everybody can do that no yeah. one there's no one who's incapable of doing that and i think that's why i'm i always try to be the biggest beacon of, of hope and optimism that i can to be to, to everybody around me is like there's nothing special about me that's not special about you yeah just find the thing that you're motivated by and that you're passionate about and start chasing it just right. whatever that is, let it be your Because you will need that. You will need to show up you, for a lot of days. Which is why you, you have that. to be passionate about it, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's it. That's, the, that's yeah. the first thing you need in your toolkit. It's funny that there's so much to say about such a simple, almost cliche. But yeah. it's like the older I get, the more I look at it, the more I read books, the more I talk to people. I'm like, fuck, it really is that simple, huh? Yeah. And it's, it's like, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's funny. I like it. Sometimes I'll get like mad at it. I'll like be trying to dissect it and like yeah. figure out these formulas. And it's like, nah, just like be passionate, show up, do your best, get better at your craft, keep going. And you're just like, all right, cool. And, and, and what I would add to that too is like, and this is another big testament to the Arizona boys. And it's, it's very much a piece of, of New Jersey culture is figure it out. You don't have the answer. Go figure it out. You know, and that was the thing was all of a sudden, you know, like as the manager, and this is, this is one of the, like, I would say of like a fundamental fabric of what's helped drive me forward every day was you didn't know the answer. And, and it, in Arizona, I was the, 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 the specifically appointed person to be the person to figure stuff out. We want to yes. do this. We don't know how. Jake, figure it out. Figure it out. Yeah. And that kind of got me in the habit and ritual of being like, all right, cool. So just, you know, get, be resourceful, try to figure out things that we didn't understand and, and every day pushing that forward. And that's, that's how it continues. Be yeah. passionate. And then you want to do something. All right, cool. Work to figure it out. Yeah. Don't, don't wait for someone to bring something to you on a silver platter because my story is a perfect example of that, of that won't happen. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, man. I really love that. I would like to, uh, hit you with a pivot of another Let's topic that I would yeah. love to bring up. Let's do it. I mean, I think we could dig into that, but there was something that you wrote, something that you got behind and put together that I fucking love. The great follower disconnect. Yeah. I really want to take a second to talk about that because sure. after understanding your story and understanding how authentic you are to what you do and how much yeah. you care, that's not something that you had to go and do. Totally. But it's something that I think we all feel if you're around music, if you're a creator, honestly, yeah. everybody feels this insane pressure and this stress. And I, I think that you articulated that feeling better than many uh, that I have heard. And you actually did something about it. So yeah. I would love to hear you explain that a little bit because anybody totally. who isn't familiar with that, I think that yeah. the more we can spread that and talk about it, the better. Yeah, man. And, you know, and I guess the, the conversation really all starts with it was a post by a good friend of mine and an artist that I've always admired, Chelsea Cutler, you know, just kind of voicing feelings that everyone has been feeling over the, you know, the last, especially the two, the last two years that we've all been locked inside and had nothing but our phones and social media. But we've also watched how social media has kind of dictated the way that people release music and how people live their lives and especially artists and creatives. And, you know, I think a lot of us have noticed a bit of an imbalance in the way that music is mobilized and what drives our success and our careers forward. And social media seems to play such an important role where, you know, years and years ago, it didn't at all. And, right. you know, I think what Chelsea had voiced were a lot of sentiments about the feeling of like, you know, there's just so much noise out there and it's really, really stressful. And it's, and it, and it's, it's, so, it's hard to wrap our heads around how do we keep up and how do we keep our voices from being lost? You know, mm -hmm. like it's, and, and it was reading that and, you know, I've always been passionate about kind of writing out my thoughts and explaining and kind of just putting everything to paper. And when I had read her post, I was really compelled by it because not only was I reading something by somebody that I cared about, you know, a lot and, and resonated with, but also as somebody who fundamentally, you know, like I, I, I resonate with that as a creative myself, but I resonate that with as an artist manager, as a creative manager, 
I know what feel, you know, like I know that feeling very well of what people were going through. And I just was like, okay, cool. Maybe there's a way to kind of help mobilize a little bit of change around it. You know, it's like, maybe we just get people talking more yes. because Chelsea has started an incredible conversation. And yeah. I think the only way to enact change is to keep that conversation growing to the point I where agree. it becomes so loud. It is undeniable. I agree. And, and so I ended up writing a few thoughts about just how noisy the world is and that we really, really have to figure out a way to, to kind of structure things to where people don't get lost in the noise in a reasonable fashion. You know, like I, I had no, and still have no intentions or, you know, any, any kind of thought to where you can change how all of these businesses run fundamentally. No one is, you know, a right. business is going to run the way that they want to run, but there are things that we can do, you yeah. know, and try to prioritize. And, you know, I yeah. made my post and then I had noticed that that had resonated with a lot of people. And then my buddy, Tom Rose, um, you know, who, who, who's over at Propeller Recordings, manages Sieb and a bunch of other great things. I had, you know, I had seen a post that he had made and he was private at the time. His Instagram was, you know, mainly just for close friends and family. Mm -hmm. And I, it, it resonated with me so much. That was the art versus TikTok post, and, uh -huh. um, you know, and the, the Spotify post to follow. And I just hit him and I was like, this is incredible. This is so compelling. I feel like there's a lot of people that would really love to read this. Could I just repost it? He was like, yeah, of course. And then that exploded. And all of a sudden we just started to see that, okay, cool. Like a lot of people are resonating with these specific conversations and yeah. Tom had hit me and he was like, look, man, he's like, this is really clearly connecting with people. Maybe it would be a good idea to talk about how do we turn this conversation into something actionable, you yes. know? And I think that was something in territory to where, you know, especially as a manager with relationships with all these platforms, all these DSPs, you know, and, and especially the same feeling that I think a lot of artists have is like, I'm not trying to declare war on anybody. <laughs> it's not yeah. good for any of us to declare mm -hmm. war on any of these platforms that are vital to our growth and success. But, you know, I think if there's a way to, to approach this to where this is not an attacking type action, but more so of an action oriented one to where all these platforms and the way that I look at it and the way that Tom looks at it and, you know, everybody that that's really gotten getting gotten behind it is like, this is an opportunity for all these platforms to become champions for artists in this new age of music, you know, and so we had the idea to create a petition on change.org to where, you know, for the, the digital landscape, you know, it started with for the digital landscape of just maybe it would make sense to create some kind of independent system of checks and balances, a committee with representatives from all sides of the industry to where important topics and conversations will be raised and publicly addressed. So it's, you know, bringing these situations to the floor of saying, look, what are you going to do to take care of, you know, to kind of look after the mental health of the creators that are on your platform? You do have some form of a fundamental responsibility to them. And there are not a lot of regulations to kind of keep things in check. But at the same time, you know, and to touch on the great follower disconnect, which is, I, I would say, is kind of the most important point for me. And, and the thing that I've kind of been campaigning, you know, the most is I have just found that in today's day and age, there is so much content that no one can keep up, period. You know, there's it's, it's overwhelming. And it just seems that all every platform, and again, the landscape has changed. So it's no one, I, I, I really don't think that there was any kind of malicious intent from any platform or DSP to do I this. But, that. but in effort to keep up, they have just started trying to find ways to keep all the trending content, things that you might be interested in, editorial curation. They're trying to put it all in front of you at the same time. Meanwhile, it's competing with the content from people that we're following and have been following for a long time. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm missing posts from these bands. I'm missing posts from these artists. And, you know, and some of these posts are the, the, hey, I've got new music out. And hey, like this is what's happening in my life. And these are the things that I was trying to share with you along my whole journey. But all of a sudden, people are finding that their voice gets less and less loud. And they don't yes. really have. And the biggest problem that I had with that and still have with that is... You know, and even to use Chelsea Cutler as an example, you know, let's take Spotify, and this is where the, the great follower disconnect and um, you know all of that comes in. And, and again, I have so much love for so many people at Spotify and what that platform has done for music over the years. So it's not something that I, I take in a, you know an attacking position on, but more so an, an observatory one of you know Spotify on Spotify. Chelsea Cutler has I think three hundred thousand or four hundred thousand followers. Not not monthly lists. People that have literally clicked the follow button because they love her music and want to hear more and want to be kept up to date on every release. Yep. And I remember that part of her post had talked about you know that feeling of I want to put this music out, but like I don't want to get lost. You know, and that's a sentiment that everyone has. And yes, you know, my thought process was like, well, you know, 
and this kind of goes back to the committee of a question I would want to ask Spotify, Instagram, TikTok, whoever it is, what are you doing to make sure that content that is posted and uploaded by creators that have specific followings, that connection has been made very, very deliberately and intentionally, what are you doing to prioritize that content to make sure that things that are created, music that's uploaded is delivered to the end user that signed up for it before they're getting overwhelmed by all of the content that we're sitting, that we're so, so, so immersed by, you know, and it's, and it, you know, and in the, the article that I wrote on medium, you know, it was, I wanted to just propose an idea, a simple thought, because to me, you know, to get into that, you know, I was like, well, what if, and, and I don't want to tell any platform how to do what they do, because that is not up to me, but it's simply a question that I want to raise and maybe an idea I want to bring forward of, Let's take Spotify saying, you know, someone uploads a new song. I don't care if they have a hundred followers on on Spotify. They upload a new song and you are one of those hundred. You know, there is release radar, there is Discover Weekly, but again, with so much content, so many playlists, all these things to try to keep up with, I I think people kind of forget where they can check that. And it just doesn't come as intuitively as it should. You know, it's like, but New Music Friday has always been a thing, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone always goes to New Music Friday to see what's new. And, Mm -hmm. you know, over the last bunch of years, it's just, you know, the last few years, especially it's like, these are songs that are trending on TikTok. These are songs that are trending in the big world to where, you know, the chain smokers are putting out a new song. It's these are artists that the whole world knows that Spotify is intentionally curating editorially to highlight the artists that they know that the world is interested in, you Mm -hmm. know, based on trends, based on years and years of building. But what about these smaller artists? What about these artists that don't have undeniable platforms to which is so crucial to their growth and to the growth of this business and the creative industry. It's like, what if, you know, what if Spotify put the new music on from the, the artist that has a hundred followers onto a personalized new music Friday for you, new music Friday becomes personalized to where, you know what, the first 10 songs, you know, or however many are all songs from the artists that I've been following all along. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, Oh, awesome. Cool. Chelsea put out a song. This artist put a song out. Arizona put mm-hmm. a song out. It's like, these are people I've, 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 really raised my hand to you know to to notice this stuff and learn and and it's like i feel like it is the fundamental responsibility of platforms to make sure that they are prioritizing content from the creator to the follower before any kind of editorial priority before any kind of business priority for their own you know for their own sake you know because when you kind of take a step back because I, i know there's a lot of fingers pointed in a lot of different directions and I don't think that that necessarily even really helps as much because I think people just can feel helpless. But when you have a situation like that, think about the pressure that that takes off of social media. And again, I use Spotify as the example specifically for the music industry, because that's where, you know, Spotify and Apple music is where everybody is really consuming music these days. You know, and all of a sudden it's the music is getting prioritized. You're seeing it, you're hearing it first. You're making sure that you're, you're up to date. Doesn't that take the pressure off an artist to have to go and jump on TikTok to wave and try to capture the attention of their fans? And let me jump on Instagram in case they didn't see me here and wave versus like, no, it's there. And it's like, do I want to go on TikTok today? No, I'm not really feeling like it. I don't really feel creatively compelled to do something. And when the moment strikes, it's going to be organic and it's going to be really just inspired versus like, well, the only way to keep up these days is to kind of jump on a sound that I don't necessarily love and I'll do a fun little dance to it, whatever it is, and hopefully it captures. And Mind you, there are so many artists that like, like the, the, the trends of TikTok and what that platform is, it comes naturally to them. It is what they're passionate about. And I love that. And I fully encourage that. I don't think that that's a problem at all. But I think it's like, you know, even artists like Arizona, like social media has not been the number one priority for us over the years. Our priority has been making the best music that we can make in touring, you right, know, and, right. and that's, and, you know, the idea that, you know, an artist has to find a way to exist on platforms that don't necessarily cater to those two creative outlets that are the most important for us as musicians, mm-hmm. you know, it, it becomes difficult. We find ourselves at a disadvantage. We, a lot of artists find themselves at a strange disadvantage of, okay, cool. Now I have to become an expert on all of these different platforms just right. so I can do the one thing that I came here to do, you know? And I think it's like establishing some form of an independent committee, which mind you, like, Tom and I both don't think of ourselves in any way, shape or form as like, we are the people that are going to change it. That's why we're asking for people to come and step forward. That's why we want people to kind of keep talking. I want people to throw more ideas into the mix. I want to continue to stir the pot of conversation to where all of a sudden these ideas are really coming forward and people are like, okay, cool. I have a lot of questions I'd love to ask. And I love answers from all these platforms on, you know, and, and this, this independent committee 
is is here to exist to say, all right, let's raise those questions. Let's yeah. talk about it. But let's also make sure that we are holding everyone equally accountable, you know, every platform equally accountable to these standards that are now being set in the digital world. Well, um, what you just said right there, equally accountable. And I think that there's something very interesting because, again, we don't know. And I'm everything you said, I didn't have a word to say there because I was just like <laughs> this. Like you're, you're saying it so well. Like this is incredible. Yeah, thanks. But I think about this and every creator feels this, right? Yeah. And I, I think that there is something where everyone should be equally accountable or it, it, it should be something that companies are aware of and there should be thought put into it because... Yeah talking to some personal friends that I have at Spotify, yeah. I've seen moments where it's they're very much trying to yeah, prioritize and help artists. And they're very aware of that. I can't Absolutely. say that same. I can't say the same thing for every platform that I'm aware of. And I can't yeah. help but feel like we become a metric and a stat and another user to sell an ad to on every platform. And that's where my heart starts to break is artists and creatives are stuck using these platforms and these internet yeah just internet platforms yeah. to put out art and something that they care about and that is the day and age we live in yeah. and then all of a sudden for those who want to support these artists and for the artists themselves that is not the priority anymore and it is purely just selling an ad or a statistic or a metric or time on a platform used yeah and that's where my heart breaks so I get it, you know, because it's like, yeah, like I, I actually love your idea there, but at least Spotify has release radar. At least there's some Absolutely. kind of it. And Absolutely. Like as a podcaster, I find that I've seen the difference on platforms. Like I think that that's a whole other thing too, is like podcast discovery. I read an article that there hasn't been a hit podcast in seven years because right. people find the ones they're used to and right. the promotion and the discovery, the discovery methods are so poor and antiquated that new podcasts just don't break through. Absolutely. So I, I can relate on that side as well, but at least you can see the platforms that are trying that are like, yeah. Oh, maybe we make playlists like this. And then yeah. you can see the podcasts that are like, we don't are the, the platforms that are like, we don't care, upload your shit, whatever. And I, I think that that's where the artists and I can only speak for myself, but I, I really yeah. do think that's where artists probably feel a maddening level yeah. of insanity and this crippling doom of like, what do I do here? And that like, that's where I resonate with the conversation that you bring up is like, it's not a vendetta against any one specific platform, but it's like, can we for a second take a step back and have empathy for people and creatives and artists and like try collectively to unfuck this system that just turns yeah. us into metrics and ads? That's that's personally where I really related to everything that you wrote in that. T totally, man. And I couldn't agree with you more. And I think like, you know, it's it's I think it was realizations of like over quarantine, there was a, a documentary that came out on Netflix called The Social Dilemma. Yep. which really yeah. highlighted, you know, the way that, and again, it's just the shifting of the landscape. This is a new age that no one, you know, obviously we haven't been here before. And as and right. exactly what you were saying is like, you know, Spotify is such a great testament of like, I know so many people at Spotify that care so deeply for the well-being mm -hmm. of artists that prioritize so deeply. How can we make sure that we're servicing artists in the way that we need to, you know, and, and creating these playlists like Discover Weekly and Release Radar, you know, and the thing is, is as we enter these different eras that we've never been in before, the landscape shifts, the way that things are curated shifts, the amount of content, the thing, the, the ways that we try to keep up, everything is shifting. And so it's yeah. like, you know, I think that, and 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 of course, and I think even with you know the, the the Facebooks and Metas of the world that have you know a lot of things talking about, well, okay, cool, like they're very much being driven by business priorities, and that's where content goes, and you know all these 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 platforms that are driven by ad dollars. I mean, coming from the advertising world, I understand it, I fully right. understand it, and I and it's like as a business person, I get why you prioritize. I fully, fully, fully do. However, you know, I think that. The, the, and again, this kind of goes back to the committee is like, and for me as a person, I am an artist advocate and a creative advocate before anything else. And that's why, you know, it's, it's always been passion before money. And, you know, it's like, I, it's like, we have, these platforms have a fundamental responsibility to the creators of which, you know, are the, the sole reason that these platforms can continue to be successful right? to make sure that we're servicing those creators in a fundamentally responsible way. 
Yep. And, and, and it's like, you know what, maybe it just takes an outside, you know, it's like in, in advertising, there's the ad council. There are standards set across the board just to make sure that everybody is doing the fundamental, you know, they have their fundamental responsibilities for the well being of the, of the business world that they live in, you know, and it's like, why does that not exist in music? It doesn't 100%. exist in the digital age. Hundred percent, and it's it's exactly that. It's like you can't help but, as the creative and on the artist side, and understanding the artist side, at times feel like you are the pawn in an advertising machine. And these platforms were built on creativity, and they were built on people adding something to it to then give attention and to give a platform. Mm-hmm. And again, I don't really want to point fingers. I don't think that makes any constructive changes or anything. But yeah, I think it it's help. just this ridiculous awareness that we are all starting to feel. Of like this doesn't feel right right now, and it's yeah. the, like it's growing. We don't know. No one. This isn't one person's fault, but it's wildly validating to just stop and acknowledge. Like, hey, right now in this 2020, 2022 era, whatever yeah. this scope of the internet is, feels kind of fucked. And yeah. <laughs> I have hope. I'm an optimistic person. I yeah. think that things will get better, but I really do think that I just I love that you brought this up and you started talking about it because I think things do get better when people start talking about it. And even if it's not better right now, anyone that's had this conversation, anyone that's hearing this podcast, anyone that then takes that and goes and reads the article and the petition and your Medium article, at least we're talking about it more. At least people are thinking about it more. And to me, that's massive in itself. That's it, man. I mean, that's the thing is like, we're all entering this era hand in hand. It doesn't matter what role we play. And we're realizing, okay, this is interesting. This is new. We're learning about this all together at the same time. And you know, what yesterday's landscape was is different from today's. And I think the only thing, if I have one sole purpose with this, you know, this, this push is I want to empower ideas to where all of us can contribute at to the table of saying, let's figure out the best ways for this to work. There is more content than it's ever been. The barriers to entry are lower than they've ever been. That's wonderful. Let's not discount the fact that that is incredible and that is that is so cool. But what do we do to make sure that creators are getting, you know, they are they are being fundamentally served on these platforms to which they are putting their all into, and they're and mind you, like it's 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 easy to forget, especially when you're not in those shoes. That you know, when we talk about the business and the stability of the music industry, making money is very hard. Making right. a living is very hard. Paying your rent is very hard, you know? And this is a full-time choice decision career-wise for so many people. Yes. And it's like, okay, so like, what do we do to make sure that we're upholding that responsibility so these people can grow? These people can feed themselves, you right. know? And it's like when the whole thing of why I continue to kind of really focus on the following aspect of the follow button, you know, and how important that click is and what that should mean to the to, to the creators that are creating is cool. You're building a subscriber base, yes. you know, like this is your subscriber base. So, you know, why should people not be receiving things to which they're subscribed? You know, it's like a, like a, a, with one of the examples I used to is like a busker, you know, like let's, let's take somebody who busks and that's their primary, that's their primary p- promotional outlet by choice for their music. And they want to go and busk this, you know, the subways of New York city and they make incredible music and slowly, but surely they build up a following. They should be able to have a career off of that if they can continue to compel people in that way. It's not my to- it's not it shouldn't be my decision to tell them how they should promote themselves. Right. And it's also and it shouldn't be our decision on, you know, saying, oh, well, that's not how you're gonna make money. You know, like it, it should be their own choice. It should be their integrity. They should follow that. You know, yes. and, and I mean, look, Tones and I is a great example of somebody who really converted from that. She was busking out in Australia, or it was Australia, New Zealand, I think it was Australia. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and and her music was so compelling that she built a real following and yes. now she's turned it into a business. And it's like, yes. you know, it makes it very hard for people to, to be discovered. It makes it very hard for people to even keep up with these people. And uh, Are you I just familiar? think, Oh, sorry. Finish that. Thought, no, please. go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. Mm. I'm, I'm rambling. <laughs> well, are you familiar with uh, Colin and Samir? They have a YouTube channel. They talk a lot no. about creator economies. I really no. respect what they're doing. Um, yeah. It's not just music. It's just creators. Yeah, uh, They talk about a concept that I really love. And I, I think that it's kind of alluding to everything you're saying is in this day and age, there's no reason why there shouldn't be a creator middle class is mm-hmm. it becomes this pressure where all of a sudden as a creator, you think you need to go so fucking viral and become the next tones and I to make yeah. it that, that yeah. in the only way that you can go from busking on the street 
to having any amount of a career is being the next Tones and I. And we all know how insanely hard that is. Yeah. So to me, when I think about this, I think about these discussions and and tweaking this and working towards this to create a creator middle class because it doesn't have to come from ad dollars. People are clearly willing to support their favorite creators on platforms like Patreon or to do any Absolutely. type of direct anything, right? People are buying VIP tickets to shows, whatever. Yeah. But then you and I on the business side are seeing how much percentages are taken from that or how much even that those acts totally. of goodwill from the people that are supporting can then tax those things. And yeah. I think that that to me is the most encouraging way that I look at it is like in this day and age with so many people on the internet, both consuming and creating, there yeah. is attention and attention is valuable. And if we can level these scales a little bit and take some of the pressure off, if you can just hit that creator middle class, that's great. Not everybody needs to go and buy the fucking crazy cars and buy a mansion. People just right. want to create their art and live. If, right. if you can pay rent and do right. what you love, that's great. And people are here to support that. So how do we balance those scales? And how do we get more people to a creator middle class? That's how I think of it. And, 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 I, and I love that. And, and you know, I think the beauty of conversations like that is like, I certainly don't have all the answers to that. And that's why I want to empower the conversation. I want people to come forward with ideas. I want these yes. ideas to be able to have a public forum to where we can discuss them and all these respective platforms can think about it and saying, how can I help service that idea? Yeah. Is there a way that I can help service that idea? I, I want to hold myself accountable and responsible to give an answer to that. And, yeah. you know, and I think, again, back to, to, to continue to harp on the following thing too, is like, there are real businesses that can be built. You know, you don't have to have millions of followers. You can really, if you have a sustainable following of, of you know, it, it doesn't have to be crazy. You can live, you can live comfortably. You can live a life that, that, that you want to live, you right. know, and also artists that are in, that are in that, that phase of whether you call themselves, you know, you're just starting or you're developing or, you know, you've got your fan base. Like if, as long as you're able to make sure that you can deliver to the people that are subscribing to you and you're not mm -hmm. having to try to, run to get their attention no matter how hard you worked to get it, yep. it you know that is where that imbalance exists and i think yes. it's like finding a way to really tether that back together only creates good for every creator yep. and i think it allows people to say you know what cool even if i'm making very niche music and yes. it's not for everybody but i know that there is a big pocket or a small pocket of people that love this and that would support me through that journey yeah oh, amazing amazing and that should and that deserves to exist yeah are you familiar with the concept of a thousand real fans um tell me more <laughs> there's an excellent <laughs> article written and i can link it in this and i'll share it with you after but yeah basically please. the idea that if you can get to a thousand real fans and supporters that's kind of the tipping point of like you can live off of this Absolutely. And like, maybe that's kind of a different way to say the creator middle class, what I'm talking about. But yeah. again, coming back to what everything that you shared and talked about, <laughs> my thing is like, please don't fuck that. Like, please don't like that little glimmer of hope, like the people that aren't trying to like make it big. And it's like these platforms in the shift right now is like, please don't let me lose hope and sight of like at least that attainable goal because yeah. if this attention economy gets so so skewed and that model is even then broken it's like yeah. come on but that to me is another thing that i think of and the idea is just that if a thousand people i hope i, I i'm i hope no, it's no, not no, ten thousand but i'm pretty sure it's a yeah. thousand <laughs> I'll feel like a goob if it's 10. But anyway, that that number is that idea that like it's not that many when you hit that. You granted you have to work towards it. Of course. But you do. once you get to that, that's when it can start to get viable. And I hope that I look at that as a very encouraging thing because that feels like a very real number. And I think you're absolutely right though. And I think even w whether it's a thousand or ten thousand, I think look, and also that depends on the platform. Right, sure. if it's Patreon, yeah. and you're asking for a donate, you know, for a monthly a monthly subscription or donation of however much it is. I mean, even and, and again, depending on what that is and what your needs are and how you explain it to the fan base that actually cares about you, you could have 500, and that you could right. be living being right. Able to pay exactly. Around. Yeah. I mean, look in in, in places of 500 people donating three dollars, four dollars a month, like that's right. for some, you know, depending on where you live, like right. It, or think about 500 people showing up at a show, <laughs> 500 tickets sold. Absolutely. That's pretty fucking good.
Absolutely. And there are sustainable livings to be derived from that. But I think that the challenge has become is like, you know, again, there's so much content and people are forgetting about the implications of prioritizing their own, you know, these platforms prioritizing their own needs and business desires to make tons and tons of money and to keep their lights on. Of course, I get it. I totally get it. And I, and I, and I do appreciate it. However, it's, you, you can't disrupt these connections that are so fundamentally important to the life and well-being of the creator that period that right yep exactly and uh, i mean again too it's like is this podcast did we find the answer in this no (laughs) but every conversation that's had i think gets us that little bit closer because then it's like it comes back to what you were saying is like figure it out right yeah it's like cool we've addressed it problem cool figure it out is that answer going to come overnight no but like it's addressed as a problem and then it's like, cool, how do we figure it out? And the more people agree that it's a problem, the more people that get on the same page of figure it out, right? Yeah. The petition is getting very close to the goal of 500 people just in that, right? Sure. So it's like every single, by the way, if you're listening to this and you haven't, there's a link I will include. Make sure you go and sign that. But yeah, thank you. more and more, like, right? Like, let's get yeah. people on that same page. Let's figure it out. I mean, and the thing is, is like, that's the beauty of like, I want people to just talk about it and keep airing those those the ideas because like i also welcome people to come and disagree with everything that i'm saying right yeah i absolutely welcome that like there's no there's there's already a solution what if (laughs) like hey you guys are talking barking on the wrong tree this is it's solved great thank you exactly i I, like i i all i want is for people to talk about it and to feel comfortable talking about it and not feel like anyone's putting a target on their back by talking about it we're just trying to fix this together like i i there's there is no bad guy in this conversation. There's only champions. There's only people that want to help champion and positive change. And I use, I like to say positive change just because this is a positive, you know, mm-hmm. like we're, these conversations are a positive and, you know, and, and that's, that's where it begins. So like, yeah, I mean, are, are the things that we're talking about here and the ideas that we're discussing, are those the 100% solves? I don't know. I have mm-hmm. no idea. And I'm certainly not going to assume that it is, but all I know is like, it's 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 conversations like this that at least should stimulate the thought process to say, all right, cool. That's really interesting. I have a take on that. Or I I I I think that what you're saying is is 20% right. And here's the other 80%. And it's like, oh wow. Yeah, totally. Cool. Yeah. Let's find yeah. a platform to highlight that idea. Right. And let's actually now get the conversation loud enough to where people are really inspired and these these platforms are, you know, undeniably be able to to address it. I mean it's there there and there are so many and it's it's just like right now it just seems like it has to be so overwhelmingly loud to where they're forced to but i also want to see people it would be amazing to see some of these platforms just say you know what you know like because right now yeah the, the, the petition does not have a ton of signatures but i agree with everything here and i want to help i want to put my i want to cast my hat into the ring of saying we're here to help we're here to be a resource and yeah. we want to answer these questions and we want to hold ourselves accountable for the sake of the you know of the benefit of the creative community so totally. let's do it, totally. you know, and, and that's where the conversation really begins. Yeah, absolutely. And I also think too, there's the level of like, there's the metric of how many signatures is there, but then there's also that reach of like, is everybody that listens to this podcast going to go and sign it? Absolutely not. But is this, right. is any amount of this going to ring true with them? And is that going to resonate? And then are they going to have a casual conversation in passing with a friend? Like the trickle effect does go crazy. So yeah, just the fact that you were taking, you don't have to do this, right? You're out, like you're good. You're in your <laughs> lane. Like this is not like what you decided was going to be your mission to right. change your life. But this was you just saying, hey, you know what? This is important. Let's take a second. And here you are now spending an hour with me talking about this. Like clearly you believe in it. Yeah. And that's encouraging, right? Like if more and more people say, all right, cool. Alone, I'm not going to solve this. And it's a huge thing to take on. But there's other people out there that are thinking about it. Let's I'll take 15 minutes myself to talk about this. Like Whatever. That's huge. Yeah. And and not only that, man, I mean, if you work in the world of music, you work in the creative world to where any of these platforms are leveraged in any way, shape or form, whether you realize it or not, it affects you. It does affect you, you know, and that's why it's like, whether you do something about it, whether you want to talk about it, whether you want to take action or not, you are making a a conscious decision to do something, Yeah, you know, so it's like, you can either have a conversation with somebody about it and talk about it, you know, sign the petition or don't. Or don't talk about it with anybody and just let it be someone else's problem. But that's a decision. That's, that's a conscious choice. But and I think it's like, you know, it's it's up to all of us. You know, this 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 affects us one way or another. 
yeah. to, to yeah. do something about it. And the fact of the matter is every time we pick up a phone and and use any single app or platform, like we are a part of it. Like yeah. every single minute spent on a platform, you are a part of it. So absolutely. It's true. Yeah. Absolutely, man. Dude, this was remarkably insightful. I, this was I, awesome, Andrew. Thank yeah. you for having me. Dude, yeah. I, thank you so much for taking the time again. Like you're on a you're you on too. a trip right now. You're on a writing trip. You did not have to do this. This is a oh, Saturday I'm, morning. I'm, and you took I it. love this though. This is yeah. I I mean, look, it's my favorite thing to have conversations with people and, and just kind of discuss perspectives and also hear like hear your story and hear where you come from and hear your take on things. I mean, I I live for that. I mean, that's also like a beautiful part about this community. You know, yeah. I always say the music industry is like summer camp. We are all so connected <laughs> in ways that we don't realize. And it's so nice to get to meet people like you, man. So thank you. Absolutely, dude. It's been a true pleasure. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Oh, I guess we should ending off uh, where I'll link all of what we talked about as far as yeah. the petition and all of the articles. Awesome. But what is like the main what is the thing if somebody listens to this and they feel compelled? Like, is there one specific place to go to or like um, in, as far as the conversation itself that we just had? I mean, I, I made I, I made it a very simple URL. It's change.org slash music industry. Cool. Um, you know, that's, that's where it starts. That's where the conversation cool. starts. That's where you can find a lot of the materials just to read, get caught up. Here's some perspectives. You know, the medium article that I wrote is at the very bottom of that. You can find everything. Yeah. And, and beyond that, even if it's not clicking that, like have a conversation, talk about it with some friends, get their cool. perspectives, try to think of what ideas you can. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where I would, I would leave it for sure. That's beautiful. That's great. And props to you for making it just such an easy place to go. That That's, <laughs> that's a very smart Advertising, move. man. You got to keep it simple. You gotta, you gotta. Awesome. Well, thank you. So there you have it, Jake's story. If you're here at the end, I will make sure that I have included every link to this discussion, to every article, to every petition. Take a second just to read more about it and challenge yourself to have this conversation with other friends and start thinking about that. Because like we said, it starts with these conversations. Anything we can do to spread that awareness and keep this discussion going is positive motion in my opinion. In addition to that, I didn't wanna press him for it on the episode live, but but as you may know, there's a Where Are All My Friends Discord channel, and I invited him to come onto the Discord and talk more about this with us as a community, and he kindly said yes. So if you're listening here at the end, and it's around the time of the episode coming out, make sure to look for that event. I'll have a link to join the Discord, and we'll set something up there. Think about this episode. Think about questions you want to ask him. Think about your perspective of that. I'd love to talk to the community more about it as well. With that said, thank you for listening. Share this episode with friends. Share this with anybody that you think should hear this conversation. I'll be back next week with another episode. That's it.